Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Scott Bollier here from uh, the College of Business at NDSU. I'm Dean of the College and delighted to be with you all this afternoon um, for our second Menard Speakers um, Series event of uh, the 2021-22 academic year. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure today to be hosting Alice Marie Johnson virtually, uh, who will be talking about criminal justice reform uh, in her experience. I'll be providing a short bio uh, in just a minute. Then we have a clip to help you all visualize uh, Alice Marie's story a little bit, and we'll turn it straight to her for um, actual telling of her story. Uh, Alice Marie will talk for um, short, just, just short of an hour, uh, and then we'll have a, a Q&A. For the question and answer period, a couple of ways that you all can ask questions. If you're tuning in virtually, feel free to drop questions in the uh, question box, and I'll try to get to them as moderator. Uh, if you're up in the Louise here in Barry Hall, uh, feel free to write a question down on a piece of paper and our moderator up there, John Bitson, will come to the podium uh, and ask. Try to get as many questions in as we can and uh, uh, look forward to a, just a really great program. Without any further delay, um, Alice Marie Johnson is CEO of Taking Action for Good Foundation, author, advocate, and former federal inmate, and is a renowned leader, speaker, and luminary in the criminal justice reform movement. Since being granted clemency and more recently a full pardon, Alice has committed her life to helping others and continuing to fight for criminal justice reform for the women and men who are still incarcerated. Her story received worldwide attention when Kim Kardashian West advocated for her release for, from a mandatory life sentence without parole. After serving over 21 years in federal prison, Alice Marie was pardoned in August, on August 28, 2020. Uh, she has appeared on numerous media outlets advocating for criminal justice reform and has been a featured speaker and panelist at numerous instrumental events and summits across the country. Uh, I will say this when I get a chance to as well. It's wonderful to have uh, Alice Marie at NDSU today. We hope uh, once the world gets a little bit more normal, we can have her back uh, for some in-person events as well. So before we turn to her, um, just a short video to help you all understand uh, the magnitude of uh, Alice Marie's story. Please hang tight for one second. I'm a 62-year-old mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. In less than two weeks, October 31st were marked by the 21st year of confinement at federal prison. I lived what was probably a pretty normal life. I married my high school sweetheart at a very early age. I became a manager during the course of the years with FedEx. I was a manager in computer operations and in customer support. Me and my husband had five children. We had a very tumultuous relationship. And after 19 years, it came to a close. I lost my job. I had been recently divorced. My husband vamped on me. I had absolutely no support. I made some very, very bad decisions. I was told that the only thing I'd have to do is pass along telephone messages. It seemed pretty simple. The first time I got $1,000, it put food on the table, it helped keep my lights on, and it just kept happening. And during the course of all of this, my youngest son, Corey, was killed in a terrible accident on his scooter. So at this point, I'm a grieving mother. I'm trying to pay for funeral costs, so I go deeper into this. Everything came crashing down when I was arrested on a drug conspiracy, never having sold drugs or used drugs. It was my telephone. I was first of all offered no jail time, and then they gave me, if I cooperate, then they offered me three to five years in prison if I signed a plea agreement. My attorney recommended that I do not do that, and I found myself, after a six-week trial, being convicted by an 11 person jury and later sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I left my children motherless when I went to prison. Their father was nowhere in the picture. During that time that I was incarcerated, I accomplished what was termed as extraordinary rehabilitation. I started writing plays, getting women involved in things that they never thought they'd be able to do. I sat with women who were on hospice. I sat with women who were suicidal. I became mother, sister, grandmother to so many women whose lives were changed because of my presence. 
And had it not been for my story catching the attention of Kim Kardashian West, I would still be in prison. The woman was in every cell, screaming out my name, crying, beating the window, beating the bars. They were so happy. It was a huge celebration that took place that I could hear it. It sounded literally like an earthquake. They were so excited. On June the 6th, 2018, the world watched as I ran across that road into the arms of my awaiting family. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Cause all I ever have Redemption songs Redemption songs Thank you. North Dakota State University for allowing me to come and speak to you today. I had to, re I had to just really prepare myself again after watching that video. I can never watch it without really getting very emotional because that day will be forever etched in my mind. And I want to thank, before I get started, your incredible governor, and First Lady Burgum for their support of criminal justice reform and the work that they have been doing in this arena. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And once again, I'd just like to say thank you for having me. My great desire would have been to be in person today. Um, I didn't, none of us expected this pandemic to go on this long. And I, when I accepted the invitation to come and speak to you, I was so excited. There's nothing that thrills me more than being able to speak to the next generation, to tell you not only my story, but to talk to you about my topic today, From Prison to Promise. We are never ever to be defined by the worst mistake that we've made in life. And as college students, I want you to just imagine the sentence that I was given. As a first time nonviolent offender who never had a run in with the law before, I made a terrible mistake. I've never said that I didn't do anything wrong because it, having any part of criminal activities is wrong whether it was my phone, a message, whatever it was, I would never say that I did not commit a crime because I did. But it is the sentence that I received as a first time nonviolent offender that was also a crime. And that is a crime that is still, still being committed against thousands of other individuals just like me because honestly, even though they've said, and I guess you could term it, the things that I was able to accomplish in prison was probably extraordinary when I think back on it, but not so extraordinary that I'm an oddity, that there are not other men and women who are still incarcerated, who deserve that second chance in life again. I think that as a college student and as others, I think there's not too many of us who have not made mistakes in life, but I'm going to put it on the level of being a student. In your very first semester, you are still partying, you're having a good time, your grades have dropped, and you see that you walked away with a very low school. In fact, you had all Fs for failure. You failed, not failure, but having failed at that moment, you'd make a decision that I am going to go back and I've got my act together. I don't want to see those grades, you work hard. And in every single class, you have a 4.0 average. And at the end of the year, when you receive your final grades, your term paper, everything, A's. But at the end of that school year, you receive your grades and you still have an F because you're told that it does not matter what you've done to correct the situation, but your first semester is now defining you 
for the rest of your college years that you can never ever redeem yourself. That song that you heard, Redemption Song, was one that described what occurred for me because I've been told that having a life sentence as a first time nonviolent offender, it meant that there was no opportunity for redemption. No matter what I did, no matter what I accomplished in prison, no matter how much I turned my life around, no matter what accolades I had, it didn't matter that the warden of the prison became an advocate for me. And she also wrote to the president. It didn't matter that the captain, it didn't matter that the staff, it didn't matter that the women who I was incarcerated with also began writing letters on my behalf for my freedom, for me to be granted clemency. None of that mattered, none of that mattered because in the federal prison system, there is no opportunity for redemption. Life means life, especially for a person serving a life sentence. No parole board would ever hear of the things that I've been able to accomplish and even not having an outdate, I made a decision going into that prison that I was not going to blend, just go along to get along. The only thing that I took with me because I was stripped of everything, everything, all of the trappings, everyone had to wear gray or white, khaki, gray or white, that's all that we were allowed to wear. And that is a colorless place. Very little greenery, mostly concrete, razor wire and steel. But the place that I found myself in could not contain my spirit. It could not contain my dreams. It could not change my character. I became a person that was in prison, but on the inside of me, I never allowed prison to get inside of me. I never allowed the darkness that was around me to define my ability to search for light and find that light and find a purpose in prison. You know, even during these hard times and these dark times, uh, you've seen just a little bit of what it means to be separated from family. But during this pandemic, the world knows what it means now to be isolated from loved ones, to be separated and not be able to have physical contact with those who you love. So they felt just a little bit of what it feels like to be in prison because many of us became in prison in our own homes, separated from our loved ones. But I made the decision that nothing can take my integrity, nothing can take my character, nothing can make me stop dreaming. I remember when I first came to prison, the very first prison that I arrived at was 1,500 miles away from my children. I lived, I was convicted, I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was sent to a prison in Dublin, California. And that would be more than just a physical separation. That meant that they couldn't even come to see me on visits because it was just too far. Every mile that I travel in that first plane taking me mile upon mile away from my family, the only thing that I could think about was my children. The only thing I could think about was my family, my, my elderly parents and how they must be feeling knowing uh, how far away I was going. Being able to be in communication and just hearing them on the phone became the thing that I lived for. At that time, we didn't have any video visits. So just hearing their voices on the phone was manna for my soul to just hear that they were doing okay. And I learned that being a mother does not change because you go to prison. I was still mama and my children still depended upon me for advice. They wanted to tell me about their good times, about their bad times. And so I had to, I, could, I would never stop being mama. I had to learn how to mother 
from the inside. But as I said, nothing, nothing whatsoever could take away my dreams. When I first arrived in Dublin, I will never forget this woman who was in a wheelchair. And she saw me, maybe she saw that I was looking a little bit lost. And she asked me, what is your name? And I told her Alice. And she said to me, and that stuck with me. She said, Alice, bloom where you're planted. God knows where you are. And that truth and those words became substance to me that in the bad times I held on to that substance, that God knew where I was. I was alone, but I was not alone. Even surrounded by thousands of women, you can still feel alone. But upon arriving there, I started seeing opportunities. I saw things that from my work experience and from the things I had experienced in life, I would never arrived in prison limiting myself, but I looked at every obstacle as an opportunity. Because of my experience, I was given a job in vocational training, which is called VT. And what I did there, even though I had no outdate myself, um, I would help the women prepare for life outside of prison by facilitating classes for them, by teaching classes and typing and helping them uh, I would do mock interviews to help them prepare for life. But I saw something that was wrong, that was missing. I saw women who were like myself, had long sentences, but were not allowed to participate in educational opportunities other than GED because they were saving all of those classes for the people who had hoped to go home. So I questioned that and I asked, how do you tell a person not to hope? How do you tell a woman that you are not to hope, that you're not to prepare for a future? And as I talked to the women, they, they were discouraging me that this couldn't change that it had always been like that and that it was out there for a reason. But I want you to know that sometimes you need to be the one not to wait on the next person, but you need to be the one who has the courage to question. So I questioned that system of the education and I started writing it up. I met with our warden. I questioned her more. She could give me no logical reason for telling a woman not to hope and not to prepare. Because in my situation, I didn't spend that life sentence. And some had 20, 30 years, they could not take advantage of those opportunities. I fought for those women and I won. And because of that, an educational system was changed for those women in prison. And a good friend of my, mine, Cheryl, after long after I left that prison, she told me later on when I came home, she said, Miss Alice, every time a woman was able to go to that class and prepare for her future, I would tell them that you have Alice Johnson to thank for that. I never thought the things that I was able to accomplish, I never thought that anyone would hear about those things. But in after, not even a year after my release, on March the 8th, 2019, I'd been summoned to the United Nations. They'd heard of the work that I had done in prison. They'd heard of I'd been able to change an education, not only an education system, but to change culture there by bringing theater into the prison, which is another whole story. But I was awarded a, the Women's Rights Defender Award designation for being as a prisoner, not for the work that I'd done outside of prison. And I was given that at the United Nations, I was the only individual from North America. There were four women, one from Africa, an African chief, one from India, one from Mexico. And here I am, a former prisoner the daughter of former sharecroppers in Mississippi, 
in the United Nations receiving a designation as a women's rights defender for something that just came naturally to me. When I heard the introduction, one word that was left off, I'm not only a criminal justice reform advocate, I'd have to add the word fierce. I'm a fierce advocate for the causes that I see are wrong. I don't just advocate, I put my heart into it. When I went to the next prison, I saw something, I was only there for a year. When I went to the next prison in Fort Worth, Texas, I found another situation that I had not expected to see. I found women who had mental and physical challenges, who were excluded from many things that the women like myself because it was a medical facility, but there were also women there who were not medical because we had to be the ones to take care of the facilities and do the work for the women who were in the hospital or the mental health part of the prison that could not do those things. These were the women who were on the fringes. They didn't really join in to the things that we did. So I helped coordinate the first ever Special Olympics for women who had mental and physical challenges. They heard about it at the Special Olympics and they came out to the prison. You would not believe the excitement that broke out over the whole campus as these women started seeing things that they could do. They were not limited, not only by prison, but by their physical conditions. They became a part of a community. In that dark place, light came in for them. They we had ceremonies, awards were given, and I coordinated a dance for a woman who had lost her legs because she said that the thing that she missed most was the ability to dance. And I was a, also a dance choreographer. Not only did I write plays, but I also choreographed dance at the prison. And so that touched me so that I wanted her to feel the exhilaration of dancing again, even though she was a double amputee. And I choreographed a song for her that was performed at the ceremonies called Never Under Never Give Up, the song called Never Give Up. And she was able to use her upper body motions and to dance along with the dancers. And at one point she was carried through. It was one of the most beautiful sights that you ever want to see. And I was given an award that I know that they made up for me because I've never heard of such a thing. But the Special Olympics, uh, the National Special Olympics, I received an award as Special Events Coordinator of the Year Award. But it wasn't the award itself that gave me so much hope, that gave me so much satisfaction. It was seeing people see that no matter where they are, that their life is not over, that there's possibilities, that no matter how dark it gets, no matter how dark your situation is, that you still have hope. And that was a message that came from that. When I was also in prison, I started writing plays as I became famous in prison as a playwright. But the thing that was so exciting around the prison was every time that I got ready for a production, I would find people and hear their voices and say, that sounds like this character's voice that I'm looking for. It became a funny thing because they knew that I would do, I was talent scouting on the compound, but how much light and excitement and hope and satisfaction it brought to the community it brought to my prison family. Because you see in prison, in a women's prison particularly, we didn't have gangs. We created families because we were natural nurturers. So it brought even more a sense of family, 
a more of a sense of community, that we're working on something positive, something good that is going to benefit all of us. Light came into that darkness by way of theatrical productions that changed the lives of many because many women had never had anyone applaud for them. So on those days, those productions, and we became so popular that not only did I have to do four productions, but the outside public were allowed to have tickets to get tickets, they didn't purchase the tickets. They would only allow so many volunteers to come inside, but it was a limited number of tickets. Usually it was around a hundred. They would look so forward to coming into the prison. And this was not amateur stuff. This was production. This was productions. I believed in excellence. That became my motto for these women is have a spirit of excellence. And I also told them, if you can do good, do it. Because we all have the ability to do good. Thus, my organization is that stayed in my heart, which is called taking action for good. Because good is not just a thought, it's an action, it's a verb. It's something that you do. And I think we all have the ability to take action. At the beginning, before I began speaking, you saw a video where I was talking on this video that went viral. And I want to tell you a little bit about how that came to be. While I was in prison, I began the very first time that my story came out was in an ACLU campaign that they were looking for six prisoners who were serving life uh, for a nonviolent crime, life without parole, because I said there's no parole in the federal system. And I will select, they found that there were over 3,600, I think something like 48 uh, federal prisoners who were serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. I never thought I would be one of those selected. I just put my heart into what I wrote to them about what life without parole felt like. One of my close family members had visited me in prison. And when a one person goes to prison, by the way, they don't just go by themselves. Their entire family goes with them. I was missing from my family and my family could not be whole until I was returned to them. And throughout all of the years, they never abandoned me. We stayed close. We stayed very close as a family. But anyway, getting back to my story of how the ACLU found me, I told them, I wrote to them as they were making their selection process. And I was selected as one of those six persons that will be a part of their national campaign. There were four men and two women, and I was one of the women selected for that campaign. So I started receiving national attention in 2013, but I also had many disappointments because I had applied for clemency and I was denied three times because at that time I didn't understand how the clemency process really worked. And I didn't understand all of the layers and all of the things that go on. And that's something else that I'm advocating for is to change that process. But I became, that was my first with the ACLU, my first public appearance, I'll call it, where my image was out, my voice was still not out. And in 2016, there was a criminal justice and clemency radiothon that took place in DC. Once again, I was selected to be the voice of, a, of the prisoners. I was the only one that they heard that day. There were entertainers, there were people from all walks of life who were part of that radiothon. 
and my warden submitted me to be the one to speak and I was selected. So now not only my image is out, but they hear my voice. There's a picture of me, but they don't see me talking, they hear me talking. While I was in prison, I was given an opportunity to speak at various colleges. We had, re we had recently gotten video visitation where it's similar to Skype where I could Skype in with my family, we could have video visits, but that also allowed me to speak on platforms outside of prison. And I was granted that permission to, first of all, I spoke at Hamas College, then the uni a Yale University, then the University of Washington in Seattle, then New York University. I was literally fighting for my life hoping to gain attention to my case and to the plight of others. And that I would, it's almost like winning a lottery to get clemency, that I would win that lottery and be set free. Uh, but once again, I was denied. And I saw, the, uh, I saw the president leave and the clemency project 24 was over, 2014 was over and I was still not selected. I was asked to do a video op-ed for Mike, an internet, uh, I think news uh, outlet. They heard me speak because I also started speaking at Google and YouTube events via video visitation, via Skype. So here I am in prison and I had no idea how unusual that was. When I came home, I realized that no one else had ever did such a thing. I started speaking at universities and speaking at Google YouTube and they heard me speak and they asked if I'd do a video op-ed, which was a part of that image that you saw with that little twist curl on the side and my hair up, pulled up in the uh, old 1960 secretary look but I did that video op-ed and it went viral. The second day, the actual first day, and by the way, I had no idea what tech terms meant. I didn't know what trending meant. I didn't know what viral meant. And when they told me, Miss Alice, you're trending. Some of the guards told me that, which was frightening in itself. I had to ask what is trending. And then I was told that you just went viral. It had hit a million views. And I was so afraid because I thought I had just introduced a virus into the internet. When Kim Kardashian saw it, and it was someone that she follows, that I don't even know if she remembers who sent it to her, but she said that she had not been on Twitter for a number of days. That particular day, she turned it on and she said, as soon as she turned, looked at Twitter, pulled Twitter up, she said, my face came up alive on her screen. And she listened to my story and she tweeted out, this is so unfair. She contacted her attorney, Sean Holly. Sean Holly was able to locate me in the prison. We talked and she asked me, she said, Alice, one of my clients is a very rich and famous woman and has asked me to contact you to, deter to find out if you'd like for her to hire me to help you get out of prison. I said, let me think about it, yes. <laughs> anyway, it turned out two days later, or well, before that two days, I called my daughter and I asked my daughter, will you please Google, who are the clients of Sean Holly? I knew Sean Holly was a very famous uh, defense attorney because she was a part of the OJ Simpson dream team. And she also represented a lot of very high profile clients, celebrity clients, including, including the Kardashians and Jenners. So when my daughter told me who her clients were, I just seen Kris Jenner on TV. 
And I told my daughter, I said, I know who it is now. It's Chris Jenner. And my daughter said to me, what if it's Kim Kardashian? And I said, Kim who? My daughter said, you don't know who Kim Kardashian is. I didn't, I had no idea who she was because I went to prison in 1996. And at that time, there was no internet. Kim Kardashian was a little bitty girl. So I had no reason to even think that it was who or know who Kim Kardashian was. And it did turn out to be Kim Kardashian. And you probably heard me on there on the video call her a war angel. I call her a war angel because she literally went to war for me. As we became friends, and I'm glad that I did not know her as a celebrity because I met Kim Kardashian as a person. And she met me as a person. In fact, even today, she calls me family. We developed a close relationship and she wouldn't stop fighting. She contacted whatever it took. She was going to do it. She said, if I can save Alice's life, I'll do whatever. And she did. She fought relentlessly. She contacted Ivanka Trump, Jerry Kushner. She finally got an audience with the president on my birthday. She went on my birthday and it would be seven days later that I would be set free, that I would be granted a com sentence commutation. In those seven days, as the whole world waited and wondered if Alice is going to get clemency, I've been told since I came home that there were so many people praying for my release, so many people glued to the TV, wondering if Alice Marie Johnson was going to be set free. The day I was released from prison became a day not only of leaving prison, but a day of promise, promises that I made I was watched all over the world and given this huge platform. In fact, in 2000, when the clock dropped, when the clock changed over, Google does a thing every year where they do a commercial and they'll have the most Google people of that year. And in 2018, I was one of the most Google people of 2018. That was a moment when the country came together. The country saw a family reunited. They saw not only a mother reunited, but a mother, a sister, a great grandmother, a grandmother, a cousin, an aunt, a friend. They saw me and saw my plight and heard my story. And I literally, became the face of criminal justice reform. It touched and it grabbed so many people. I never thought that my story would lead me to the places that it has led me or given me the platform that it has given me. When I walked out of that prison that day, you heard me say on that video how it sounded like an earthquake because these women had become my friends. They had become my family. We had lived in community. We had experienced losses together. We had experienced joy. We had experienced things that a family experienced. We held each other up. We looked after each other. We comforted each other. And I made a promise to those women that day as I left prison that I would never forget about them and that I would never stop fighting for them. And that is exactly what I did. I hit the ground. You saw me running across that road, but you have not seen how I have been running ever since. I've not been running for a political office. I have been running for people. I have been running to help change a system that is greatly broken. I have gone the day that I came out, it was not even two weeks later that I was in DC trying to help get the First Step Act passed, telling my story, using my face to remind them of the many 
countless faces that they would not see, using my voice to not only tell my story, but to tell their stories, speaking wherever, going wherever, running, 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 trying to help get this First Step Act passed. And it was passed. In fact, at the press conference where the president talked about the First Step Act, which by the way, is the most meaningful piece of criminal justice legislation that has been passed in 30 years. And thus far over 20,000 people have come home early. But the president said in his address that he asked for, for sentencing reform because originally it was going to be more rehabilitative reforms because of those sentencing reforms, because of one spark, one spark, my case became a spark. You can become that one spark. We never ever know what life has in store for us. I said, I never ever wanted to be famous. I just wanted to be free. But a promise that I made to the women and also to the men, of course, I was not incarcerated with the men, but they were incarcerated just like me. They were separated from their families. I made that promise and I have held up. I have upheld that promise. Not only did I feel that it was my duty as a person who had been redeemed, I had experienced redemption. And it wasn't because I was so wonderful wonderful are the only one. There were many thousands of people like me who deserve to hear that redemption song, who deserve to and were worthy to be given a second chance in life. Over the last, I'm going to say two years, I submitted over 100 clemency petitions myself, working almost day and night, trying to identify cases that was one of the main reasons that my organization, Taking Action for Good, was literally launched during a pandemic because I wanted people to have a way that they could reach out to me because there's no way that I could identify everyone. But as much as I could do, while I could do it, I did it. And as a result, 46 people received a second chance through clemency, pardons and compassionate releases because I just don't believe in putting a period on something where there should be a comma. I now continue that work of criminal justice reform all over the country. I have spoken to at different events. And as I said, I wish I could be, have been here at NDSU today in person, because that really is one of the things that I enjoy most is being present and, and being there to speak and look into your eyes and you see me physically and not just on the screen to encourage you, not only by my story, but by my actions, that one person can make a difference. Sometimes we feel paralyzed because everything around us seems so dark or it seems like everyone has the same opinion that this should just be like this. And sometimes we don't have the courage to question and think or think that we can make a difference because it just seems like it that everyone else is of this same opinion. But I found that most of the country knows that we have a problem with our criminal justice system, with our justice system. They know that we have a problem. Now people are speaking up more and more as stories like mine get out, because as they used to say in prison, can nobody shut Miss Alice up? Nobody. When I see something is wrong, I am there. And I am not going to shut up. I'm not going to stop fighting because the women and men who are still incarcerated are dependent upon me. 
So I encourage all of you to be that spark, to be that one that breaks away from the norm. Don't let anyone tell you what you're not capable of doing. All of us have opportunities. Sometimes those opportunities can come in the shape of obstacles. They can look like an obstacle, but in reality, they're opportunities. But it's up to you, it's up to us it's as to how we seize that moment, how we seize that opportunity. There are many Alice Johnsons, there are many Alice Marie Johnsons out there who need you, who need you to take up this cause. And if you ask me, what can I do? What you can do is when you have a returning citizen, 95% of the people who are incarcerated are one day coming home. Some of you are going to go on to do great things. You're going to be business leaders. You're going to be uh, faith leaders. You're going to be leaders because the fact that you're here at this great university lets me know that you take your role and your path in life very serious and that you want to make a difference in life. One person can make a difference. If there is a returning citizen, give them a chance. When they have paid for their mistakes, it might just be if you know them, they're just like me. They're just like you. Their families probably in the grocery stores with you. Your children will be in classes. You probably have some uh, children of incarcerated parents right there at that university that you're attending, treat them with kindness. Don't allow maybe what they've done in the past that you know that they have a criminal record. Don't let that be the judge of the person. And to the employers out there, we have so many jobs in this country that are open. Everywhere I go, even to even to just a, uh, a fast food place, there are signs in the windows saying hiring. When I got my receipt at one of the uh, very well-known department stores, on there, at the end of the receipt, it had a number for me to call if I was seeking a job. So I encourage those who have jobs open, or if you know of companies, give these returning citizens a chance. Re-entry is extremely important. Not only do I fight to help people get a second chance in life, but I also continue to lift up the plight of those returning citizens who need not just a handout, but a leg up. So I thank you so much today, North Dakota State University, for allowing me to speak with you today. This time has just flown for me. But I, I want to give time for any questions that you may have. And I am looking very forward to one day being not virtual, but present at your great university. Thank you. Alice Marie, thank you so much. And uh, what an inspiring uh, story. So I want to uh, start just with uh, a, a question about returning and uh, um, being free and what that was like for you. So. On the one hand, you come out and you're somewhat of a celebrity uh, because of all of the attention um, related to your case. And that had to have been a, a plus and a minus, right? Like you didn't, you didn't have to deal with some of the reentry difficulties of others, but at the same time, there's this expectation that you'll be everywhere immediately. Can you talk about reentry just for the typical um, person trying to um, return uh, after imprisonment and what it's like and the challenges that they face? Uh, I'll be happy to. I did face some of those challenges though. One of my biggest challenges was in technology. I came home and I saw everyone looking down doing this and uh, they were texting. They were on their smartphones. And so I knew nothing about technology. So coming out and not knowing technology, a lot of people just assumed that I knew what I didn't know. Um, I came out, it was very difficult getting identification. 
That's one of the things that I'm really pressing on the state level, on all levels really, is to make sure that when people are released from prison, that, that they have insurance because I had no medical insurance. And my first two weeks home, I got extremely sick. I don't know if it was food poisoning or if it was a matter of I'm eating good food again. Uh, but I got extremely ill and I had to go to the hospital. And that bill was just recently paid, not long ago. I accumulated, I paid on payments on it. I accumulated a massive hospital bill because I had no insurance. So that's something, you know, that's not a hard fix. Whether you're coming out immediately, there needs to be something in place. And I just feel like every prisoner, whether you believe they're gonna come home one day or not, should have something as simple as a birth certificate in their files. Because without any ID, I'm not even speaking about driver's license. I'm saying just some state identification. You can't get a job. You can't open up any kind of an account. It's just things that you're hindered from doing if you don't have proper identification and you really are playing with fire when you come out with no insurance. And of course, there are the housing challenges. There are many uh, housing, uh, uh, I'm gonna say many places that will not allow a ex-offender to rent from them. Even the government, housing closes out when you think they would really be more really wanting you to get settled because successful re-entry is beneficial to all parties. It makes our streets safer because you get uh, people who are recently, they don't feel hopeless. Just imagine, I just imagine how it would have been for me if I'd had absolutely no support. I'm sure, you know, we do, I would not have gone back. That's for sure. I've said if I had to push a a, a, a grocery cart under the bridge, I'm not going back. But there's just many challenges that people face who are released. And that's some of the things that I've been making sure that I bring attention to. Not only bring attention to, there's a lot of organizations. I try to make sure with the people that I help gain their freedom, I became, sometimes you have time to find a resource, but sometimes you have to be that resource. And I found that I had to be their resource for many people that were coming out that didn't have immediate, they didn't have anyone there immediately to not only welcome them home, but to help them find the needed resources. And that can be mental health. They can take many different forms. Yeah, we have a, a great uh, organization here um, that is supporting a number of communities in the state of North Dakota doing exactly um, what you're describing. It's called F5 and uh, uh, just trying to give um, different offenders what they need on the um, re-entry side. And it's different things for different people. Some have tight-knit families, but then uh, no resources. And uh, it's, uh, it's God, God's work that they're doing. Uh, so we have a group of in-person students and uh, alumni and community members up in a room called the Louise. And I see that they have a question. So we're going to bounce back and forth a little bit here between me okay. and uh, our director, John, in that room. Hey, John. Hi, Scott. Uh, so Alice, uh, we actually, we have Adam Martin, who's a uh, founder of the F5 project, the project that Scott just talked about is, is here with us in the audience. But I also, I just wanted to say there, we do have some questions from the audience, but I did want to say just personally, thank you for sharing your inspirational story. What a beautiful story about how just of hope, perseverance, and just how we can all make a difference. And, and wow, I'm super inspired. And thank you for that and for all the work that you do for everybody. So just thank you for that. Uh, but a, a, a question from the audience is, uh, so could you speak a little bit about Ross Ulbricht's uh, double life in prison and 40 plus 40 year sentence? Uh, are you familiar with? with well, yeah, him? Ross, as a matter of fact, Ross was one of the individuals that I literally was in tears over. He was a person who I personally advocated. I resent his petition in. We had so many ups and downs and false alarms where we thought that Ross was going to get it. But at the very end, he did not get it. And you know, I know that he created something. I'm not saying that everything was perfect, but he created something that people uh, uh, he created something through the internet. It's, it's whatever you have. 
I'm going to say, let us say, I don't know if I should give this example, but I am going to use this example of a gun. The purpose of a hunt gun is for sportsmanship. People have used it for food. It was not created to, to kill. The makers of, of the companies are not charged when someone misuses something. And I, I just think it's terrible that Ross is still incarcerated. And I actually continue my fight for Ross. I've met his mother. I've met so many others last, uh, well, earlier this year, actually was able to be one of, um, I went to the Bitcoin festival, who they all, the Bitcoiners all love Ross. Um, and even before then, but his mother's so sweet and kind. And I'm just really hoping that this young man will one day be reunited with his family. And I've also looked at all of the incredible things Ross has done since he's been incarcerated. Ross is a young man that I truly believe should be hearing and running out on that same song, Redemption Song. So the other part of the question was, is there something that we can do to help him get out, like write letters or something? I think that it's very important that those who are in leadership, that have the ability uh, from the highest level I think you need to make your voices heard. Uh, Ross has a lot of supporters, including myself, and I certainly have continued to make my voice heard on behalf of Ross. So I would say, make your voices heard on behalf of Ross. And uh, there are some things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about right now concerning, but his, his mother, Lynn, she and I stay in close contact. And in fact, up until the very last hours, we were on the phone. I was on the phone with Ross's lawyer, Brian, trying to see what else can we do. He, this, I just really am not going to give up on Ross. And I don't think any of us should give up on Ross. When there is something, an injustice such as Ross's, this sentence he has been given. I believe Ross has been incarcerated now since he was around 26 years old. And it's just enough is enough. He is not, he does not pose. I think that the three elements of a reason that a person should even be incarcerated. Number one being safety. Number two being retribution. Uh, is a, it does the time fit the crime? And the other one is rehabilitation. So if you're looking at a Ross, he has satisfied all three of those. So I think it's, it's we must not forget about Ross we must continue to lift our voices to keep his name lifted up. Thank you. Alice Marie, the next question comes from a law professor, a friend of mine, and uh, just wanted to ask your thoughts on the justice system and the court appointed attorney element of it. I, I don't know if that was your um, situation per se, but just the, the justice isn't blind. The justice system is what you can pay for and afford. And um, just wondering what kind of Monday morning quarterbacking you've done after getting the advice you mentioned in the video of, you know, you can, you don't need to bargain. You can probably get out of this. And then you ended up getting this really heavy sentence. Can you comment on how you look back on that and your thoughts on the giving people a good defense aspect of your story? Well, that's, that's, that's really key. One thing that I, I remember my attorney telling me because my trial turned into really a kangaroo trial. And he told me when he visited me in prison, in prison, in jail rather, before I went on off to prison, he said, Alice, I'll get you out of this. We've got all of these issues that should not have taken place, convicted by an 11 person jury, many things. Um, he said, you may spend 13 months and I remember telling him, I can't do 13 months, not knowing that I would end up being in prison over two decades. One of the things that I truly believe we should hold, the, hold those who are in public service accountable. There is, there is too much immunity where there is absolutely no recourse. Some judges are appointed for lifetime positions. Uh, and it's just saying with some of these cases, sorry, it's just not good enough. Maybe there should be some type of term limits put on. 
I don't know, I've thought about this often. How do you fix, how do you, what do you do when you have, you see a course of, of what we used to call um, in prison. I know that's an old West term, but I'm not going to use that term. But anyway, judge is that um, everything is long sentences, long sentences. And when you try to do mandatory minimum sentences to kind of fix some of that, that made it even worse. That led to mass incarceration because now you've got uh, judges who take nothing into consideration. They just put a rubber stamp on it. Okay, it says this amount of testified bills. You don't need to have evidence. Let's let's just use and let's come up with a number and let's give you a mandatory sentence. That in itself is wrong. The whole conspiracy uh, guidelines, especially in federal, that is extremely broken. Uh, in states, states, there is no state that does not have uh, parole. Uh, you've got some, you know, you, you accept feds. What's the difference between a federal a prisoner and a state prisoner that they are not deserving of redemption. But uh, in terms of to go back to your question and looking back as to some of these that are appointed and also representation of the poor, if you're poor and cannot afford good rep representation, uh, you really kind of hit. There's another question from the audience. Uh so do you advocate the use of drug courts as a, pre, a form of pre-incarceration rehabilitation? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, drug addiction in itself is a sickness. Some things have been altered in your brain where it really, you need, they need treatment. Incarceration, especially in some, some prisons, I'm not gonna say all, the person goes in, a drug addict, and they come out a drug addict because they still have access to drugs if they want them. And using a drug court, instead of automatically sending someone that you know has an addiction problem, you're still not treating it. They're gonna go in a drug addict and they're gonna come out a drug addict. And it's going to be a revolving door and a cycle. We have to get smarter on the way we sentence. We have to get smarter. Some people think that if you start doing these things, you're soft on crime. I say you're smart on crime. And also you're helping the community because now you've got drug court that allows a person an opportunity to get help rather than prison. I was in prison with way too many drug addicts and who just needed really treatment where sending them to, pr to prison was not the answer. And just think about how much money, if you want to get into the finances of it, just think about how much money can be saved by having drug court and getting the help that individuals need for their addictions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alice Marie, a, a question about um, just your contact these days with uh, Kim Kardashian West, President Trump, um, and also just how many, they were the faces of you um, being released, uh, but how, how much was going in behind the scenes in terms of like numbers of attorneys and letters and all of the things you were describing uh, okay. a few minutes ago? Well, first of all, uh, Kim and I were just texting yesterday and we were laughing about her uh, Saturday Night Live stint. And because I watched it and I kept watching it and laughing. My daughter had a favorite one of them, which, cause she's a, a mother of twins. So she could understand the, uh, the Saturday Night Live skit where they were uh, all exhausted, but trying to go out and party. Uh, really my favorite one was the clock where she did the switch off. I would love to do some of that type of stuff myself, by the way. Um, but we stay in close contact. As I said, Kim still calls me her family. I've uh, gone out um, in Los Angeles to visit her family. And uh, you probably know that I was in one of her Skims commercials. Please, everybody, don't go back and look that up. Please. I did that as a favor. <laughs> I still can't believe I put on some Skims and took my fat self out there in a commercial. But that just lets you know that they are for everybody type. 
but we stay in close contact. And honestly, with uh, President Trump, I there is not. I will be forever grateful for him taking the time to listen to my case and to grant my freedom. Because even though a celebrity brought it to him, I still had to be a worthy candidate. I still had to pass through the grill that the FBI took me through to make sure that what I was saying was true because that really would have been disastrous to release someone and they go out. I had to, It had to be that who I said I was, but over 270,000 people actually signed the petition for my release. And it's very seldom that the warden of a prison will write a letter. That is very unusual. I had a letter, I, my warden wrote, my captain wrote, as I said, staff members wrote, and the women who were incarcerated themselves started writing letters asking for my release. So you were put in a situation where you were told that there's no opportunity for redemption, and yet you kept hope, you persevered, um, you knew that you could make a difference. So, so what do you attribute your strength to in terms of keeping your hope up and still believing that you could make a difference, even though you tried and tried and tried and were being told, well, no, you can't make a difference. What made you persevere? What do you attribute that to? Well, I have to tell you, I'm a woman of faith. And my faith just made me believe that one day I was going to come home. But I had made up my mind that whether I came home or not, I was not going to get busy with the business of dying in prison. I was going to live in prison. And living in prison meant not just being serving myself, but serving others. And that really and truly gave me purpose and, and really freedom in prison. I've said that when they let me set me free, they were setting a free woman free because I had already gained freedom while I was in prison. I was free from what people thought about me. I never, ever asked a woman in prison why you're here. When I met a person, I met them on that day. I don't want to know why you're here. I'm meeting you for the first time. You have a blank page with me. And that meant so much to people for me to just be accepting of them, of whoever they were, and to treat them as a human being. That was something that was very surprising to me when I came out. And I had some trolls that I didn't know what a troll was, but I was quick to find out what a troll was. I had people that would troll me because uh, the President Trump set me free. I'm like, are you crazy? What do you think? I'm, because you're gonna troll me and I'm supposed to say, no, I'm gonna wait for the next person, someone you like to set me free. You're trolling me too, because I'm still going to the White House, talking to the president, advocating for the release. <clears throat> of people who are in the same situation that I'm in and having someone literally ask me for my opinion and to find people and I'm not going to do it. What a traitor I would be if I did that. Not only a traitor to myself, a traitor to the people who were locked up depending upon me to advance their cause, their cases. I thank you, beautiful. Um, Alice Marie, a question about, you mentioned this, that uh, the entire, your entire family went with you to prison, but can you comment a little bit more on the costs to your family of you being in prison and uh, what, you know, just how far that spreads and reaches out? Okay. In prison, I was making 18 cents an hour. Telephone calls were $3.20 for 15 minutes. So you imagine how many calls could I make making 18 cents an hour? and uh, doing the work that I was doing. So my family, for people who don't have any support in prison, there are some jobs that pay higher. There was a job that I did have that paid more than 18 cents, but uh, it was working for the prison industry. And I realized that I'm working to keep myself in prison. Who's going to lobby for me to get out of prison if I'm making so much money for you? by using my expertise. I was an Adobe print illustrator and they bragged and say, oh, you're so good at this. These illustrations that you're doing, because I'm very good with hand-eye coordination. I quickly moved up, was moving up through the ranks. 
And so when my supervisor told me how much they were selling, how much the work that I was creating for them was making them, I quit. I said, they're gonna lobby for me to stay here. And so I never worked one of those jobs again, but I do understand why some people work them because they have no family support. I was blessed to have good family support. My family exhausted uh, really more my daughter than anything, my oldest daughter. Uh, she graduated from college the year that I came, that, that I went to prison. She had just grad well, she graduated in 95. I went to prison in 96. So she had a really good job uh, with the general dynamics as an engineer and then went on to be a, a project manager. So she made sure that I had the things that I needed. I had some other family members that would occasionally help, but my other children, they couldn't help. She had to step in and be the mother for them. And, you know, my daughter, my children, they suffered while I was gone. My daughter was preparing to purchase a home and she took every bit of her savings. And I called her one day and she said, mama, uh, I want you to think about what lawyer you want. Now I know we don't have any more money. We don't have nothing. Even when I went to prison, you know, to have been labeled as some type of a queen pen, I had nothing. I didn't even have $500 in the bank. But the people who testified against me had houses, cars, money seized, because I, I found out the system rewards those who testify. So because I had phone records, I became their boss and they got off some with three years, some with no time while I'm serving a life sentence. And, you know, that's just the way the system is still set up. But my family spent so much money. My daughter took every dime that she had saved to purchase her house. And she said, I'd rather have my mama home than have a new home. So she just gave it everything she had up and it still didn't do any good. The thing about once you come into prison, your best chance is not to go to prison, of course. But by the time you get through, it's like a, a, um, a funnel. At the top, that's before you enter prison, it becomes narrow, more and more narrow and harder and harder. You find out if you don't win your appeal to do a 2255 to, to do other um, motions, it gets harder and harder to have a sentence overturned. So my family, they just kept spending money upon money. Uh, and, and in fact, I stopped them from doing so much. I decided to educate myself. And so I spent a lot of time in the law library, but I wouldn't let myself be consumed with finding a solution because once again, I'm giving myself over to something else or it's consuming all of my time. I couldn't even let freedom consume me. I fought for my freedom, but I didn't let that become the driving force in my life in prison when I got up every day. I'm headed to the law library. No, I read books. I started studying and I started filing motions for women, helping them become free, but could not get myself free. But, you know, it's something I do believe, Scott. I do believe that the reason that I could not get out any sooner was because God had a much bigger purpose and a much bigger plan for my life. Sometimes we are tested to see what we'll do when no one is look, looking. And I think when no one was looking, no one could see anything that I was doing that was part of my testing to see if in spite of being knocked down and said and told no, would I still trust, would I still fight for others? And I always thought anytime anything went on at the prison, this was crazy what I'm about to say, but the first thing they would do is they said, does Miss Alice know? Because they know I'm lacing up my boots quickly, putting my uniform on and I'm walking. You see me walking across that compound to talk to the captain, to talk to someone, to find out what is going on. And so that, that I think I was practicing in prison and didn't even know it, practicing for, for what was going to lie before me of I don't care what, don't give up. Thank you. I think we have two more questions, one from a criminal justice student and then one more um, from me. Uh, so it, our students are just chiming in saying, what a, what a wonderful woman you are. Um, you know, they're, 
very emotional and what a great story. Uh, the criminal justice student is asking, um, how do you even know where to begin in advocating for different um, reforms within or outside of the system? And like, when is it just a waste of time and energy? Like, I'm not going to move the needle on this one, but this one's worth fighting for. How do you calibrate and know how to help? Well, for me, uh, I did try a whole lot of different things when I first came home. I was all over the place. I was just trying, this is wrong over here. I got to fight over here. I got to do this over here. But I found out that doing the shotgun blast uh, method was not working, not just in everything. I can't do all things. Sometimes people think I could do all things, but I can't. Uh, they tried to give me every, and it was really hard to say no to people because it was a good cause. And it is something that I might need to lend my voice to. But I found out that if I focus on what, and being the best at what I could do. And I think I'm the best at storytelling and getting the faces for the stories is what moves the needle too. I realized that it was my story that changed the heart of America. And so I started finding other stories and highlighting them. So my organization, Taking Action for Good, that's what we do. We get the stories, we tell the stories. We tell how it's impacting family and embedded in those stories are other issues like bail reform, like uh, getting identification, like having a good reentry program. That's embedded in all of it. But it's really, I, I use those stories to help move the needle for people seeking clemency, people seeking pardons. But it also, those stories are also used in many other ways. And so I'm able to, not become expert in everything, but the thing that I am good at, I'm really good at, and that's telling stories. No doubt about that. And uh, so maybe one last story for us. I watched that video of you running. Uh, you said it sounded like an earthquake um, in prison. I, I get emotional just watching it. Uh, can you describe what that moment was like and uh, um, end on that note? Yes. When when I looked up, because the prison that I was in, it housed 1,600 women. It was built for 1,600 women. And when they got the news that I was going to leave that day, uh, they locked everyone down. Because little did I know that media, literally from all over the world, was standing outside the prison on the opposite side of the street with my family. I didn't know what was going on because I'm shut off from everything. All I know is I, Kim has just told me I'm going home. An hour and a half later, I'm hearing my name over the intercom, Alice Marie Johnson, report to R&D with all of your property. And I'm like this. But right before she told me that, it was actually on the news, but I wouldn't watch the news. People would say, Miss Alice, I think you're going home today. Uh, you're going to get clemency. I go to my room and I shut the door and I look out of the window because I had so many false alarms. And even though I'd been so hopeful, it was almost as if I was afraid to be disappointed. And so Scott, it was hamburger day and we only got hamburgers once a week. And so I go to the dining room to get my hamburger. And before I could even bite into it, they're calling my name, but I could hear all of these women crying and screaming because so many of them called me mama, grandmama, aunt, auntie. That was a big one, auntie cousin, but we were family. So they were just stomping and they had every, every window that I looked in, you could see a woman in that window. They were beating with the cups and then they started stomping in the, stomping the floor. And it's a four story building, three buildings, four stories. And it literally did sound like an earthquake. It felt like the ground was shaking and my heart just melted. When I looked at, up at those women, and I made a motion that I was tearing my heart out and I threw it to them. It was crazy. They went crazy. And I had to pass by the camp that had like 250 low security women. And when I was leaving out, every guard was at attention. They had made a pathway for me to walk through to the building. And when I got in the vehicle with my brother and a few other family members and had to pass by the camp, because a lot of the women who were at the camp had been at the highest security behind the fence. So they were all out. And I could hear them before I got to them. 
they were all screaming the same thing. We love you, Miss Alice. Don't forget about us. And I looked over there and I saw one woman and she's now free. She became so overcome, she fainted out there. And it just, I walked, my heart was just so full. It was so full that I know that I knew that I would never, I promised them, I told them, I screamed out there. I said, I will not forget you. They couldn't hear me, but that's what I was just saying in my heart and at the window. And I was crying, looking at them because this was my family. So for me, some people may look at this at criminal justice reform as a cause. It's not just a cause for me, it's my life. And on that note, I think we're gonna leave it there. Um, please uh, come visit us. Uh, I think the governor and first lady would be delighted to uh, see you and we can weave together an event and uh, let you tell our story um, in person with new freshmen or some other slice of campus or our community. And uh, I think you've warmed our hearts today. So um, thank you so much uh, for being our guest, uh, Alice Marie, and it was wonderful to go back and forth with you. Well, thank you again, NDSU. Uh, can't wait to come out to your campus. I can't, I can't see the whole campus of people who are watching, but I sure can feel you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.